Midtown Studios of Bloomberg Television in New York City, this is Charlie Rose. Welcome to the broadcast. One of the pivotal figures in the 20th century is here. Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev has written his memoirs, and I'm pleased to have him on this broadcast to talk about his role in history, to talk about his memoirs, and to talk about the future of Russia, a land that he loves. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. The title of the book in Russia is not memoirs, it is what? Life and reforms. Life and reforms. Because I think that reflects more accurately what I wanted to say in my book. It is life itself that prepared me to start changes, to initiate changes, because many things were not working. And uh, from the very start, many things in our system, in our society, were based on pressure, on uh, the use of force, on party control. Uh, life demanded something quite different, and we felt that. We felt that when our society, after several generations, uh, became more educated, became more critical of our life. I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about when you realized that things had to change. But first, an overview. There are many opinions about your place in 20th century history. Some look to you as central to ending the Cold War. Others see you as a destroyer of a great state, the Soviet Union, a superpower. How do you see your role in history? How would you like to see it? <laughs> well, uh, of course, well, history is... Um, um, I would say, uh, really something we cannot control. We cannot control what will be written about us in history. And on the other hand, I think that uh, the generations of future historians and people who will be uh, reading and studying history, it will be difficult for them to ignore the fact that um, it was with Gorbachev that uh, our country ended a situation where we had no freedom and went toward freedom, toward freedom of speech, toward freedom of conscience, toward freedom of choice, toward freedom and acceptance of political and economic pluralism. All of that was uh, laid down by Perestroika, and that is the basis with which you can begin to think about future changes, about many changes that are still ahead of us. So I would say that my role in that respect was uh, constructive and creative because it empowered the people, the citizens. The citizens were no longer those who just executed the will of the state. They became citizens, they became persons and they could realize their potential. This was my principal idea. The problem is, how can we in Russia today take advantage of those opportunities that uh, people now have? Are we ready? Are we ready? Will we be ready to use freedom? But That's looking back question. at history, when you made those crucial decisions, you understood the risk, and you understood that you were creating circumstances that could end as they did for you. You understood the risk. Indeed, and absolutely. When I was still president, I was on a visit to Japan, and uh, a student, a girl, asked me a question that was similar to what you have just said. She said, Mr. President, democracy means competition, means freedom, and perhaps at the next election you will not be elected president. I said, yes, that's quite possible, quite possible that they will not elect me, but I will be pleased, I will be glad, because elections is why I really risked everything, freedom and uh, the 
opportunity for people to make a choice, democracy, that's important. That's what counts most. And therefore, I think that speaking about my country, I can say that despite all the hardships that people are going through, and today life for many Russians is very difficult, I am amazed, I admire the fact that during the recent opinion polls, the opinion polls after the uh, elections, they revealed that 82% of the people who want to live in a free and democratic country, despite all those hardships and discontent, they want to live in a free country. They clearly do. Why did only 1% want you to govern Russia? Only 1%. Well, I would say that uh, if you look at it purely from the standpoint of arithmetic, you will uh, not get an answer. I think you will not get an answer even from the standpoint of calculus. Um, but let me tell you what the situation was. Starting in the fall of 1993 until the fall of 1995, the communists were gaining in support among the voters a lot because Mr. Yeltsin's reforms were making life for people more and more difficult. And people began to recall nostalgically life under communists. Uh, it was not a very good life, but certain things were guaranteed, and people thought about that, and communists were gaining support. Um, people saw that, and most of our people said, well, we must prevent the communists from returning to power from exploiting those difficulties. And people would have voted for someone if I, Yevlinsky, Lebed, Fedorov, and those others who represented the democratic center, if they united in one team. And I wanted that, but Yeltsin was very much afraid of that because he knew that people didn't want communists, but they disagreed with Yeltsin too. 60% of the people, according to polls, disagreed with both Yeltsin and the communists, but we were not able to unite. I ran because I wanted to unite with other Democratic candidates. Yeltsin, however, was able to separate that coalition. You wanted to unite with... Uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I think that... Uh, you know, we ran separately, but sep even separately, together, we got 25% yeah. of the vote, but, but I together we would have won the election. So, the idea, if I understand it, you wanted to create a third force, which would be a democratic force. Yeltsin on the one side, communists on the other side, and you'd be in the middle. You and Yavlinsky and other democratic reformers. Yes, that was the idea. After the election, there was a poll, and they asked people who voted for Yeltsin, and 50% of those people said that they voted for Yeltsin despite the fact that they disagreed with him and despite the fact that they disagreed with his policies, but they voted for him in order not to allow the communists to win. Since the Democrats were not able to unite, they had to choose. Of fear of the communists. Did Yeltsin make a mistake in opening the door and encouraging Lebed? The same mistake you made with Yeltsin at another time in 1991. It, no, I, I, I think that the main mistake of uh, Mr. Yeltsin was a different mistake. He was not prepared to really assume a responsibility for conducting reform in our vast country. He was not prepared, meaning what? He was not ready. He was not ready in that he didn't have enough experience and his outlook was wrong because he was committed to a strategy that was quite different from mine. He wanted to dismantle the Union and for Russia alone to abandon the other republics and to be alone and to take advantage of all its resources and to make a rapid breakthrough to become a prosperous country in two or three years. That was reckless. Today, everyone understands that that was Shock therapy was not good for Russia and was reckless. And the disintegration of the Union, that was the worst. But people supported Yeltsin. I must tell you that, yes, they did support Yeltsin.
Почему? Потому что в 1990 году и в 1991 году очень осложнилась ситуация на рынке. The consumer market was very empty. The the stores were empty. There was a kind of chaos in the country. And Yeltsin made a promise, and people believed that promise, and they followed Yeltsin. Today, people are wondering. Yeah, but they say that your flaw, your fault was that you believed that a better communism could be democratic and solve the problem, problems of a modern Russia, that you held on to your old beliefs too long. Well, this is what people in the West think. Yeah. They think that it is Yeltsin who made the most important thing, who did the most important work so very much consistent with Western aspirations. But that's a mistake. Because we don't understand really Russia. We don't understand Russia, right? No. Uh, you know, there is this fear of communism which makes it difficult for you to really understand the realities. I decided that we need to reform our country through the process of free elections, through the process of glasnost. That is the end of the communist model, because the communist model is based on force, on repression, on one ideology, on one form of property. All of that I changed. So the utopian model was based on all of those things, and my reforms ended all of those things. So what Yeltsin did after that, that was reckless. That was just an adventuristic approach. We should have continued to move step by step. Why is it that people in the West, even well-educated people, think that Gorbachev did everything in order to preserve the old system? Well, in the beginning of the process of reform, like Khrushchev, I thought that we could make the system better, we could make the system more democratic. But already in 86, but, that, but already in 86, uh, no, no, let me tell you, as early as 1986, in the fall of 1986, I understood that the nomenclature will soon do to Gorbachev the same thing that it did to Khrushchev. The nomenclature. The nomenclature, right. Yeah that it will do to Gorbachev the same thing it did to Khrushchev. And therefore, I decided to implement political reforms that meant the end of totalitarian regime, that meant the beginning of free elections, that meant the end of nomenclature. And uh, this is the most important thing. Without this, nothing would have changed in Russia today. So, in 1986, as early as 1986, I I began the process of political reform. I concluded that the system cannot be reformed, that the system should be replaced. What do you think of the Chinese criticism of your policy in that you emphasize political freedom and you should have emphasized economic reform and been more restrictive on political reform? Well, you may remember that we did not start with political reforms. We wanted to start with economic acceleration. We wanted to modernize the machine building sector. We wanted to bring in new technologies. We wanted to restructure our industry, to um, de-emphasize military industrial complex, to really make the economy serve the people and their needs. But all of that, too, could be done uh, if you give freedom in the economic area. And therefore, we started to implement leaseholds, cooperatives, self-financing. We uh, gave more freedom to businesses and enterprises, and the nomenclature saw that uh, their power was slipping. Their power was slipping, and the producers are gaining more power. And therefore, the nomenclature started to resist change. And because of this, because of that resistance, in order to break that resistance of the nomenclature, in order to give uh, way to reforms, we had to get the support of the people, of our citizens. Our people supported reforms, but how could we include them in the process? Only by means of political reform. So in our country, we really had to do what we did. 
Otherwise, as early as uh, maybe the spring of 1987, Gorbachev would have been ousted. Gorbachev would have been ousted, and everything would have ended. He would have been ousted just like Gorbachev was. When we started political reform, however, when we allowed gave the nomenclature a chance to actually prove that they had the right to govern the country. That was the real blow against the totalitarian system and against party monopoly. 35 secretaries of the regional party committees lost the elections. They panicked. There was a panic in the party. So that is why we started really with economic reforms, but we could not promote those reforms because the nomenclature was sabotaging economic reforms, and therefore we needed to uh, break that resistance of the nomenclature. How can you do that? Only by political reform. Only by political reform. Uh, a Democrat can only break the resistance of the nomenclature by political measures. If I were a dictator, then I would probably have thrown some of them to jail and others would have uh, been scared. The promise of democratic reform in Russia is more freedom and more security for the Russian people. More freedom, more security. Has that been the result of democratic reform? Well, uh, my answer is this. If you take the 11 years that passed since 1985, you have six years of perestroika. You have then the attempted coup in August 1991 that weakened my positions at a time when we were very close to actually solving a number of problems in the union, in the economy, when we also were ready to reform the party and we, we were ready to split the party into several organizations, into several organizations that already existed within the party. It was at that time that the nomenclature attempted the coup. At that time, Yeltsin used that after the referendum on the Union, when people supported the continuation of the Union, Yeltsin was uh, uh, very much afraid, afraid because 75% of the Russian people voted for the continuation of the Union. But after they attempted coup, uh, the republic started to drift away, and Yeltsin took advantage of that, and he started a very, initiated a very different policy. The dismantling of the union, dismantling of our economy, and this kind of leapfrogging reform, it really weakened uh, Russia's economy and Russia's role, and uh, that was uh, very damaging. But I would not want uh, you in the West to uh, calculate things in a, in a kind of petty way. Russia has had its problems many times. Uh, don't take advantage of Russia's weakness, because this weakness is temporary. If, do you consider the expansion of NATO taking advantage of Russia's weakness? Yes, yes, it's a bad signal. When people in Russia see that uh, recently, when the Pentagon proposed a military budget and the uh, Congress even added $11 billion to that budget, when uh, we see that uh, Americans favor the expansion of NATO and the admission of new members to NATO, when uh, we see that um, very seriously, some people are discussing the possibility of space defenses in America. The Russians are asking. The Russians are asking. The Russians are asking. Why is that? What, what, what is happening? What kind of signal are America sending to us? Are they rethinking their relations with Russia? Are they rethinking what ended the Cold War? Do they want a, a different kind of a relationship? But, but where are you in that debate? Because you know many Americans, and you know that America's intent is not aggressive. Well, I'm the number one critic of the concept of NATO expansion. When uh, 
German unity, uh, when the process of German unity was underway, we had an agreement that when uh, the uh, foreign aspect of that process was discussed, we agreed that while uh, Soviet troops were still there and after the Soviet troops withdrew, NATO would not expand to the east. You should understand that, please. Um, so we agreed that NATO would not expand its area to the east. At the same time, we decided that the process of building European unity should be accelerated, that there should be a political and defense structure for all of Europe with, of course, Canada and the United States. And we adopted a charter for Europe in Paris. And everything is described there, a common Europe, a common security for all European countries. And there, we agreed that there should be a new security system rather than expansion of NATO. But when the Union ceased to exist, when the Union ceased to exist in our country, then the United States decided to try to play differently. The understanding was that you would support the reunification of Germany, withdrawal of Soviet forces, if there would be no expansion east of NATO. Understanding. There, there was this understanding. understanding. So the United States in today's news is in violation of that understanding in your judgment. There was an understanding that the uh, troops, the NATO troops, would not be stationed or nuclear weapons would not be stationed in the territory of the former GDR, East Germany. And the question about expanding NATO beyond Germany to East European countries was not even discussed because at that time still NATO and the Warsaw Pact also existed. In order to make sure that there is no break in the process of building a, a common Europe, I uh, suggested that a meeting of all European countries adopt a charter for all of Europe on defense, on the economy, on everything, and that was signed. And we also signed a treaty on the reduction of conventional forces. So there was an understanding that there would be no expansion of NATO, that there would be a common European structure of cooperation and security. So, yes, this is a retreat from that charter. This is a retreat from that charter. And the question is, can we now trust our Western partners? Trust? Can, you don't can, trust the West? We need to be rated for Zapad. In Russia, people are asking this question. And people are debating this question. So they fear, they fear for their security. In Russia. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. The Russians those Russians who took the initiative in uh, uh, German unification, in ending the division of Europe and the world, the Russians also accepted the reductions in nuclear and conventional arms. But now they're asking this question, why? What was the point? What, was it some kind of game for our partners? Should the Russian people also fear in their domestic politics the rise of a military man like Lebed, the most popular man in Russia? Well, I must say, and I must add something else. In the West, people, of course, are watching what is happening in Russia. And when you look um, at what the Russian leaders are saying, they're saying to some of the former republics of the former Soviet Union, CIS countries, some of them are saying things that make them suspicious that Russia would like perhaps to restore that old empire. Secondly, of course, they also see that uh, uh, Russia is doing certain things in Chechnya, and questions inevitably arise in that respect. And therefore, what is happening today in Europe and uh, what is resulting in this plan to expand NATO uh, has some basis in those mistakes, in those mistakes of both Western policy and Russian policy. So I am blaming both, I am blaming both Russia and the West. I am realistic about it. In Russia, people are afraid that the Berlin Wall will be replaced by other walls very close to Russia. But 
You know, in Russia today, people are asking questions. When Secretary Perry was in our parliament, the State Duma, when he spoke to members of the Defense Committee of the State Duma, he was asked very tough questions by the deputies, and they said that if the United States and NATO continue to act this way, then the question is, should Russia continue the process of disarmament, of uh, arms reduction? And the public, the media, are raising even this possibility, even this possibility that we should retain the entire military uh, potential that uh, existed uh, when we ended the Cold War. Uh, there are some of those who are very mistrustful of Russia. Let me come back to history for a second. Who in history, what figure, Catherine the Great, Peter the Great, uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, do you, you, most identify with? Well, I've never really done that. I believe that it would um, uh, not be serious for me to identify with any of those figures. But so far as my uh, sympathy and uh, positive attitudes towards certain people in Russian and world history is concerned, I would say that um, my sympathy is not with uh, Peter the Great because he did many things uh, by destroying the lives of many people. It's not Catherine the Great, it's more Alexander II who ended slavery in Russia, served them in Russia, and who later was victim of t terrorism. How did you feel when the Berlin Wall came down? Well, I learned about that in the morning. I had a telephone call from Germany. And I said, so what did you do? And they said, we decided not to use force. We did not use force to stop the people. And I said, you did the right thing. Of course, this was a very unconventional situation. But I think that uh, within us, within myself and my associates, we already had the conviction that we were implementing, that we should not interfere, intervene in the affairs of our allies. And that should be responsible to the end of the Soviet system, to the end of the Soviet system. Well, and that was done. Uh, you know, when uh, Chernenko died and I met with uh, leaders of Warsaw Pact countries, I said to them, that from starting today, take responsibility, address all your questions, you are responsible for this happening in your countries. And then I said to them later that if our policies of perestroika are good for you, you can take advantage of them, but we will not impose perestroika on you. And we went like this until the very end. Do you think that was easy to hold on to that position for me and the Soviet leadership? No, it wasn't. Even today, some people are saying there is less of that, but still there is something. And I'm writing in the memoirs that people are accusing me, some people are accusing me of uh, surrendering the countries of the Warsaw Treaty. I gave, I surrendered, I gave Poland to the Poles, I gave Romania to the Romanians, I gave Bulgaria to the Bulgarians, because yes. those countries but belong to those people. Is peoples. that part of what you want your legacy to be? Indeed. Indeed. This is consistent with my nature, with my policy, with the choice I made, and I am standing by those decisions. And even today, I am under attack for this. But that's, that's the destiny of all reformers. It is. The destiny of all reformers is to lose power, to be under attack, to be... That's a normal process. It is... And let's recall that Jesus Christ was another reformist. And he was anathematized by other religious leaders because uh, he was an innovative leader. And you should also remember that uh, Jesus Christ uh, 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 was uh, on the Golgotha together with a gangster, with a bandit. And uh, when people were asked who should be spared, 
they said that it was that uh, criminal who should be spared rather than Jesus Christ. So this is uh, how things are. But I think that the world is changing for the better. Well, well, are you changing and becoming more religious and are you reading more about Jesus Christ? Your mother was, your mother? Yes. I am not a person who am not among those who believe. Who he is a religious well, believer, he is a follower of some specific religion, but I uh, accept the importance, I recognize the importance of religion, and I recognize the importance of freedom of conscience, and therefore one of the first laws uh, adopted in our country on my initiative uh, in the years of perestroika was the law on freedom of religion, and I prepared that law uh, by inviting members of the various religions in the Soviet Union, and almost all world religions are represented in our country. So I think that what I know today enables me to say that uh, we are part of the cosmos and uh, we are very dependent on that cosmos and cosmos is my God, nature is my God. It is there that I seek answers to many questions. I believe that the 21st century will be the century of the environment, the century when uh, all of us will have to find an answer to how to harmonize relations between man and the rest of nature. We should understand that we are not gods, we are not kings, we are part of nature. Nature existed before us, and it can exist without us. We're guests on this planet. Uh, uh, you, Ronald Reagan, Reykjavik, very close. <laughs> the drama, the drama of Reagan. The drama, yes. Drama. But that drama had far-reaching positive consequences. It came very close to an agreement to just eliminate nuclear weapons. Very controversial. Do you regret that you failed to make an agreement because of your opposition to SDI? Uh, well, I never regret because you know, when uh, that Reykjavik summit ended and uh, we uh, were unable to write some kind of document about this, but we did reach agreement on many important things. We disagreed on SDI, yes, because I was uh, uh, against that, because I thought that if we end the nuclear arms race uh, on land, why have an arms race in space? I said, it's absurd. Nevertheless, George Shultz, uh, then gave a press conference and called it uh, a failure. But then I gave my press conference, spoke to 900 reporters, and I saw for the first time reporters, very tough people who can uh, really uh, uh, kick politician, any kind of politician with a vengeance. And then I saw in them human beings, human beings asking, right, human beings, reporters asked human beings. They were asking a uh, question, why did you meet and were very close to a decision and why didn't you take that decision? But I said Reykjavik is not a failure, it's a breakthrough. We have looked over the horizon we have agreed on a number of things, and I said Reykjavik will be the beginning of a new page. And the next morning, George Schultz spoke in about the same vein. He adopted the same attitude. And then we followed with uh, additional steps. We singled out INF missiles and reached a specific agreement on those missiles and on strategic missiles. Without Reykjavik, that would not have been possible. So I... Um, and I appreciate very much the Reagan-Schultz team. What, what do you think of Ronald Reagan? I think uh, he was the person with whom we were able to reach agreement on the major issues of ending the nuclear arms race. We averted the threat of nuclear war. He was the person who uh, also changed his view of our country, the Union. He said he no longer regarded it as the evil empire because an evil empire, an evil empire could not have generated reforms. My understanding is that you you couldn't understand him because he did not come with the knowledge of process and policy that you did, yet he had a firm belief 
and two, he had popular support. So you were fascinated by him. Yes, I agree with you. My opinion of President Reagan is very high. My opinion of his uh, contribution to ending the Cold War is very high. The first bricks in that building were laid by us and then together and then we continued with George Bush and Jim Baker and they were good okay. partners. All right, but when, when, when they credit when the credit for ending the Cold War is paid, you, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, who else? George Marshall. You forgot uh, Jim Baker. You forgot Colin about Powell. the role of Colin Powell. Scowcroft. Scowcroft. Scowcroft Edward Chevernadze. Ashwarnadze. Yeah. Well, I'm speaking about yeah. the, my American yeah. counterparts. Yeah. On our side, uh, Chevernadze, Marshal Akhmeyev, Marshal Akhmeyev. Yazov, too, by the way. Yazov, too, by the way. Yazov. Even Yazov. General Yazov. Really? Yes. 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 How about the KGB? How about the KGB? Well, the, K the KGB supported the process. They did. And Krychkov? Krychkov, too. At that, at that time, I could not work without collective agreement from the Politburo. The Politburo still existed, and uh, it was constitutionally the authority. And they accepted that my policy was quite open. I was dealing openly, and it was very difficult for them to resist such policy openly, openly, because people in both countries, because people in both our countries felt that, uh, you know, we uh, were moving toward a precipice if things continued, and that something terrible could have happened if the Cold War continued. This understanding existed not only among academics, it existed on the level of instinct among people. The day before yesterday, we visited South Dakota. Yeah. And uh, in South Dakota, people remember how fallout shelters yeah. were, were yeah. being done in South Dakota. Yeah. Yeah. Margaret Thatcher. I think that the key role was uh, played by the leaders of the Union and of the United States, but certainly Mitterrand, Thatcher, uh, Cole, Andriotti, and others also played a role. They worked together with us. Even though the French and the British uh, were holding on to the independence of their nuclear forces, they say that they were not comparable, but they also supported the process of reducing the numbers of nuclear weapons. Uh, but the question, of course, was when should they begin to reduce their nuclear weapons? But that was a political question. So I believe that the world was lucky in having that kind of leaders uh, in the second half of the 1980s because they uh, were very knowledgeable, they knew uh, the dangers, and they uh, took responsibility. Many people, as you know, and you've thought about this a lot, look at you and they say this very, very, very influential and important figure of our time who helped end the Cold War who helped change his country, seems to be honored so little within his own country, with so little appreciation. Why is that? Well, first of all, I think that uh, my uh, own uh, contacts with the people during the election campaign really uh, does not confirm this uh, kind of uh, evaluation. The president was uh, giving orders to the governors to create all kinds of problems for my campaign. They did not allow me to talk to them. Yeah, they absolutely. He was afraid uh, that there would be that third force, that third force in the campaign. So, nevertheless, whenever I had a chance to talk to people, 
all auditoriums were filled to capacity. And very often I had to speak outside uh, because the auditoriums could not um, uh, did not have enough uh, room for all people who wanted to talk to me. People wanted to talk to me, they asked questions, and uh, you know what they asked me and what they complained about? They criticized me. They said, why did I allow Yeltsin to come to power? And what's the answer? Well, my answer was, let's uh, remember who allowed Yeltsin to come to power. Yes, indeed, I invited him from the Urals to work in Moscow. Of course, then in Moscow I saw that uh, he is someone who is not capable of implementing reforms. He was purely destructive. He cannot construct. But then I said, it was you who voted. Uh, for him, for president, on the first round of the elections in 1991. There were six candidates and you voted for him, I said. Uh, I uh, uh, released him from the highest echelons of power, but you voted for him. So I said, let's, let's, we were просто уволили. So I said, let's share responsibility. We were не освободили, а we were выгнали. So I said, let us share responsibility, at least equally. No, I didn't fire him. It's not my style to fire. You should remember that he, he asked for resignation. He asked for resignation. I tried to persuade him that he should remain but that he should take into account the criticism of his colleagues. But he insisted that he wanted to go. He said, I want to be pensioned off. I want to be pensioned off, he said. But I uh, uh, retained him in the Central Committee, and I uh, gave him another position. He was a government minister even after his resignation. And do you today regret that? No. No? Look no. at what's happened. Yeah. Yeah. You believe Yeltsin is... Has, you believe Yeltsin has wrecked, yeah. Yeltsin has wrecked yeah. havoc Yeltsin on Russia, has been bad for Russia, Yeltsin has led to a circumstance Russia. that has thwarted yeah. reform. Sure. All that you believed in, he has... Yes. I don't regret because I acted in a democratic way. That's the way for the Democrat to act. If I am a Democrat, if I believe in democratic decision-making, if I believe that we should not uh, persecute uh, people, that we should abandon repression, then I should have acted this way. And this is how I acted with my opponents. Otherwise, otherwise Gorbachev uh, and his appeals for democracy would be worthless. Yeltsin, of course, uh, fought the privileges of the nomenclatura. He said that he is for democracy and against the nomenclatura. But look at what the Yeltsin government is today. It consists of a small group of people of financial oligarchy and nomenclatura. So, yes, he deceived the people. And as a result, as a result, Russia, I think, was the loser by following Yeltsin. But Yeltsin, too, was the loser. And he lost as a result of this. And when people say in the West that it is because of Yeltsin that communism was abandoned, well, I think that this um, is Perhaps people in the West think that this is good for them, but it would have been better for the West, for the West too, if Russia continued in an evolutionary way, if Russia continued in a stable way, if Russia reformed itself gradually toward democracy, toward market economics. But can you believe in democracy and still be a communist? No. No. Well, there's no the idea, the socialist ideas, the ideas. Yeah, communist. Communist. Well, in effect, you know, communism is a utopia. Communism is a utopia. It is just speculating about communism is uh, worthless, is worthless and useless. Uh, at the end of last century, in your country. 
there was a writer, Edward Bellamy, who wrote a utopian novel. Yeah. And she said the world in a hundred years would be, and she painted a kind of paradise, a kind of harmonious society. And in America, there was a large movement of people, a national movement of people to support that utopia. But it was a utopia. So I am, I am not in favor of utopia. But as for socialist ideas, socialist ideas have a right to exist, just like uh, uh, other ideas, liberal ideas and other ideas have a right to exist. They are building blocks for the future. Uh, the future society will not be capitalistic or socialistic. The future society will be, I think, a, a totally new civilization which will synthesize, synthesize the experiences of uh, uh, socialism and capitalism in a positive way. What do you think of Yeltsin's chief of staff, Chabayas? I think he's bad news for Russia. Why? Because he imposed a certain model of privatization to our country. And based on that model of privatization, the nomenclature became rich and took a lot of property. But people got nothing. And Lebed is bad for Russia? Well, I think that uh, Lebed, if, if Lebed uh, continues in politics, if he tries to uh, become a key leader, he could play a positive role if he is supported by a strong and democratic team of people, if he is supported by people committed to democracy, because as a political leader, he is still very immature. But he, but he can learn. He knows how to learn. And I'm one of those who has criticized Lebed quite severely, but at the same time, I see also his positive potential. What is his positive potential? Well, his um, positive um, aspects are that he is certainly um, very sensitive to Russia's problems. He cares about the fact that many Russians today live in hardship. Corruption. He's very against, against corruption. He's against Chechnya. He rejects corruption. Yes, that's right. And you agree on both points? Chechnya, you agree with Lebed? Yes, yes. But, but, we should make sure that the solution to the Chechnya problem is consistent with the interest of both Russia and of Chechnya as part of Russia. It can be done. It's difficult, but it can be done. And I talk to many Chechens, to the members of the Chechen di diaspora. They trust me. Dudayev, by the way, wanted me to be intermediary uh, before the conflict, in the very beginning of the conflict, but Yeltsin didn't want that. Uh, if Yeltsin was running against Lebed, who would you support? Lebed. Well, in this situation, I would certainly support Lebed. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. If elections were to be held today, then Lebed would win. Lebed would win. But what would happen after such a victory, that would depend, as I said, on the team. It's very important that Lebed should have a strong team, a team of people who are knowledgeable, who have experience, who are professional. Yeah. Is Lebed a Democrat? Does he believe in democracy like you say you do? Well, Lebed wants strong authority, but he is in favor of democratic authority. He is not in favor of dictatorship. Well, at this time, what I know about him uh, indicates that uh, it, this is more likely. This is more likely. But Lebed could be a card that could be played by people, by people who are anti-democratic. So, therefore, it's very important to make sure that together with Lebed, we see people who would be able, who would be able to help him to prevent mistakes, to avoid mistakes. But he has a lot of potential. I have four questions. One, 
What do you think should have happened to the people who tried to pull off the coup against you? Well, if you speak about what should have happened, the laws should have been applied against the people who attempted a state coup, a coup d'etat. And that process was underway. That process was underway. But then Yeltsin himself fired uh, on the Russian parliament. And there was another uh, case that was being prosecuted. And Yeltsin understood what could have happened if that trial happened. And therefore, he made a trade-off. He made a trade-off. But if Russia continues like this, without laws, then we will have more coups and attempted coups in the future. Military, civil war? Well, that would be the worst scenario. Is it possible? Well, I would say that it is already underway. Civil war. Well, when you see people in Siberia, in the Far East, in Kuzbas, uh, when you see people on hunger strikes, when you see people uh, demanding that their wages be paid, and uh, when they say that the government that cannot pay their wages should be dismissed, should be replaced. That, I, I feel, is a kind of strife, a kind of conflict that is becoming almost nationwide. And the question is, well, this is still, still a peaceful conflict, but this is a civil conflict on a nationwide scale, and this is very serious. The military will step in at some time. I think that today the situation is of a kind that the army will not step in. But the army may uh, speak out to declare its opposition to what is happening. Um, and there is very little uh, concern to, uh, about the army. There is, the, the government is not paying attention to the army. How long do you think Yeltsin will be in power? I think he should have stepped down a week ago. Maybe. Because of health or because of... Yeah, he should have stepped down and resigned because of ill health some time ago, because right now it's very difficult for him to function as a president. He will simply not be able to. I saw what was happening to our country when uh, Brezhnev was ill, when Andropov was ill, when Chernenko was ill. And I see that today Russia needs very firm leadership, very effective leadership, and this is not happening, and this will not happen under Yeltsin. There's an incredible story in this book of you coming as Secretary of Agriculture in the Politburo to talk to Brezhnev. And he's like dead. I mean, yeah. Yes, indeed, absolutely. If Yeltsin is incapacitated and has to leave office, Prime Minister Chimirdin will take over for 90 days, 90 days, and then there'll be an election. And if there's an election, Lebed will win. Unless there is... No, I don't think that this is preordained, but for some reason, I think that uh, the communists will not be able to win. What is a real threat is that things may not be done constitutionally. According to the Constitution, the prime minister uh, becomes acting head of state, but then he may agree with the communists to prolong the situation instead of having elections to prolong the situation for several years. I believe that if he uh, would like first to get power constitutionally and then to act illegally, unconstitutionally, that could uh, be uh, responded to very dramatically by the people. I believe that we should continue the democratic process. That's very important. If there is some kind of a conspiracy, unconstitutional conspiracy between Chernomirdin and Zyganov, that will be ammunition to uh, some others who would like to act unconstitutionally. And that is not permissible. 
And uh, the West, too, should look at it. It should not hide away from the situation, but respond to the situation. How? By speaking in favor of the Constitution and democracy, and they let the Russian people decide who they want to rule. Memoirs, Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow night.